All right, Tracy, are you an introvert or an extrovert? You know, before we recorded this episode with our guest, Stacey Chazen, I really thought of myself as an extrovert that has some introvert tendencies. But now I'm beginning to think, to the surprise of probably everybody I know, that I'm maybe an introvert. How about you, Evan? Yeah, I've done some, you know, coursework with folks before on introversion and extroversion. I am definitely an introvert, but I have extrovert qualities. I really enjoy talking to people and I like the small talk, but it really drains me at the end of the day. So I have to be alone to recharge. And as we're going to talk about in the episode, sort of lean into some of those introverted characteristics of myself. Yeah. And it kind of leaves me a little confused because I actually get really charged by talking to people, but I hate small talk. So I don't know. We're a complicated human beings. Welcome to Hiring to Firing. I'm Tracy Diamond, attorney with Troutman Pepper, and I'm here with my co-host, Evan Gibbs. Together, we tackle all employment issues from hiring to firing. Today, we're joined by Stacy Chazen, founder and principal of iFactor Leadership. Welcome, Stacy. Thanks so much, Tracy. I'm really happy to be here. We're very happy to have you. Why don't you tell us a little bit about your specialty and how you got involved and created iFactor Leadership? Yeah, I would love to. And the best way to do that is to quickly tell you my story. So when I was younger in school and for a good part of my career, I often heard that people thought I was antisocial or even aloof, but I really didn't connect with those words. What I did know was that I found large crowds to be exhausting I prefer to have a small group of friends rather than a whole cadre of people to spend my time with, and that my best relationships and even my best work came from times and circumstances when I could go deeper and take my time and be more focused. And then I think it was in my late 30s, I started learning about the notion of introversion and a light bulb went off for me. I realized that my preferences, my approach to doing things and my comfy place in the world made me unique. And I started to stop feeling badly about those things and realized that there's a word for who I am, and that is I am an introvert. And I started really leaning into that. Fast forward a bit, and I've become quite a leadership junkie. I'm fascinated by the way that our natural preferences, whether it's introversion or extroversion or how we make decisions, can really set us up for success at work. I earned a master's in organizational development and leadership several years ago. I became certified as a Myers-Briggs Type Indicator or MBTI practitioner. And since then, I've been working as a leadership coach to help individuals who have a natural preference for introversion to tap into their strengths so that they can be more effective and move into leadership roles at work. Stacey, you are the perfect guest for us today for our topic, which is introverts in the workplace and how to most effectively manage and motivate employees that are introverts. But let's start with some definitions to ground our discussion. What are the characteristics of an introvert and how is an introvert different from an extrovert? That's a great place to start because I think the definitions of introvert and extrovert might surprise a lot of people, including what the words introversion and extroversion don't mean. So I'll start with some basic terminology. So first, when we talk about introversion or extroversion, we technically say that a person has a preference for introversion or a preference for extroversion. And this signifies that one or the other is where they are most comfortable, but it doesn't mean that they're unable to act in ways that are aligned with the opposite. When I work with my coaching clients, I illustrate this by asking them to pick up a pen with their dominant hand and sign their name. And I ask them, how did that experience feel for you? And they'll they'll typically use words like, mindless, easy, comfortable. And then I ask them to switch the pen into their other hand and do the same thing. And I ask them, now, what was that experience like? And they'll use words like awkward, uncomfortable. I couldn't do it as well as I did it with my other hand. And that's a great way to describe introversion versus extroversion. So your typical comfy default place is the characteristics and preferences associated with introversion but you are able to act in ways that are more associated with what an extrovert is here and there or when it's needed. But for the purposes of today's discussion, we can simply call people introverts and extroverts. In the world of Myers-Briggs, which some folks might know, it's the most widely used personality test in the world and the source of most of what we know today about how introverts and extroverts are wired, so to speak. 
Introversion or extroversion refers to how a person tends to direct and receive energy. So real briefly, extroverts like to focus on the outside world. They direct their energy and attention outwardly, and they tend to be energized by interacting with others and taking action. Some of their characteristics are they work out ideas by talking through them. We might say they, they think out loud. They learn best by doing, and they tend to be sociable and expressive. In contrast, introverts prefer to focus on their own inner world. They direct their energy and attention inwardly, and they tend to be energized by reflecting on their own and others' ideas, experiences, memories even. Some characteristics are, I'll say we because I'm proudly among them, we prefer to communicate in writing. We work out our ideas by reflecting on them in our minds rather than speaking out loud. We focus in depth on a, on a few interests, and we tend to be more private. Before we leave the definitional discussion, I do want to flag some myths I think are important to dispel here. Myths about introverts. So not speaking up in a meeting, which many introverts are guilty of, does not mean that introverts don't have expertise or ideas, but they're actually leaning into their introverted strength of thinking deeply. They're not arrogant or aloof or antisocial or shy. And the biggest one that I try to dispel and, and help my clients to prove false is that they're not strong leaders. When in fact, introverts have many powerful and unique gifts that set them up to be leaders. It's just not what's typically recognized in many workplaces. And they sometimes don't feel comfortable advocating for themselves and demonstrating those leadership skills in environments that, that typically don't highlight and reward them. Very interesting. Yeah, it really is. Evan, why don't you pull in our first introvert character and then we could we can talk some more. Yeah, yeah, of course. You know, so as regular listeners of the podcast know, we usually well, we always use a TV show or a movie to, you know, base our discussions around. Today we're gonna do it a little different. You know, we usually just use one T V show or movie, but we actually identified several T V show characters that we think sort of exemplify the term introvert. So we're going to start with Spider-Man. In this clip, there are several reporters who are trying to convince Jonah Jameson, the editor-in-chief of the Daily Bugle, the newspaper in Spider-Man world, that Spider-Man is a hero and not a menace. So let's check out the clip. Who is Spider-Man? He's a criminal. That's who he is. A vigilante. A public menace. What's he doing on my front page? Mr. Jameson, your wife is on line one. She needs to know if you... Mr. Jameson, this is a page six problem. We have a page one problem. Shut up. Right. Well, he's news. If they're really important clients, they can't wait. They're about to. He pulled six people off that subway car. Sure, from a wreck he probably caused. Something goes wrong and this creepy crawler is there. Look at that. He's fleeing the scene. What's that tell you? He's not fleeing. He's probably going to save somebody else. He's a hero. Then why does he wear a mask? Hmm? What's he got to hide? She just needs to know if you want the chintz or the chenille in the dining room. Whichever one's cheaper. Mr. Jameson, it's like this. We double book page six. See, so both Macy's and Conaway's both have three quarters of the same. We sold out four printings. Sold out? Every copy. Tomorrow morning, Spider-Man, page one, with a decent picture this time. Move Conway to page seven. There's a problem with page seven. I make it page eight and give him 10% off. Okay. I make it 5%. That can't be done. Get out of here! The problem is we don't have a decent picture. Eddie's been on it for weeks. We can barely get a glimpse of him. Oh, what, is he shy? If we can get a picture of Julia Roberts in a thong, we can certainly get a picture of this weirdo. Put an ad on the front page. Cash money for a picture of Spider-Man. He doesn't want to be famous, and I'll make him infamous. In real life, introverts, they find it challenging to showcase their achievement in a lot of cases, I believe. And I think that's one thing that you alluded to just a minute ago, Stacey. So... Are there ways for them to do so without feeling just completely uncomfortable and sort of out of place? Yeah, I call that the ick factor. So how can introverts promote themselves and highlight their accomplishments in ways that don't make them feel like they need to run and hide under the covers afterwards? So a typical extrovert is more comfortable speaking up immediately, advocating, showing folks, here's what I've done, here's how I contributed whereas introverts are a little more reserved in that way and are less comfortable doing that in front of a big room of people. So what I talk to my clients about is doing that in a way, promoting yourself, promoting your accomplishments in ways not only that are comfortable for you, but that actually tap into your strengths as an introvert. So for example, introverts tend to be more analytic and they they like to rely on data when they're building a case for something, and they like to have the time to pull that data together. So I would say for introverts, 
pulling together, building the case of their accomplishments, building the case for a promotion in writing is a way that's going to tap into their strengths. Doing that in a one-on-one situation with a manager or a boss, looking at the long game. So not just highlighting, here's what I did last week, but taking a look at the complete picture of, of their accomplishments and their contributions over time and pulling that into a narrative when they're building that case. So introverts tend to be very good storytellers, which is due in part to the fact that many of us really like to read. So over our lifetimes, we've read a lot of beautiful narratives. And so we're typically good at crafting and telling narratives ourselves. So when you have the opportunity to tap into that storytelling piece of it, it's a way to highlight yourself, highlight your contributions in a way that doesn't say, uh, look at me, look at me, because we, we don't like the spotlight to be on, on us typically as well, but tells the, the longer story of contributions made to a team, a project, or an organization. I'm kind of curious, did introverts fare better or worse than extroverts in the sort of pandemic and post-pandemic workplace where we're, we rely so much more on technology in terms of team meetings and Zoom meetings than sort of in-person big group conference rooms? Yeah, I don't have data on that handy, but what my instinct tells me and what I've read anecdotally is that it's a mixed bag. So certainly not having to go into an office and interact with people day in and day out is aligned with introversion. I know that for me, being at home, not having to to travel as much and face people in an office was energizing because I wasn't dealing with that day in, day out energy sap. That, that often comes when you have those social demands of an in-person workplace. What I will say is, I'll say two things. One, the burnout that often comes, the energy depletion, which can lead to burnout over time, can also occur when you're on Zoom. So when I have a day where I have back-to-back Zoom calls, I would say I'm not equally as depleted as I would have been if they were in-person meetings, but it, it still takes its toll because you're needing to be on and you're needing to focus in ways that you didn't used to. So one of the things I've read research on is that being on Zoom has made it harder for many introverts to communicate because for introverts, picking up on nonverbal cues is a big part of how we listen and how we communicate with others. So when you're seeing someone in a two by two inch box or even smaller at times, you lose a lot of those physical in-person nonverbal cues that you previously had. Yeah, I think I definitely buy into that. I have a lot of the introvert characteristics. It really drains me to interact a lot. But I do, for me, Zoom calls are more draining than in-person meetings. And I don't know, it's the ability to sort of move around and see people and like get up and grab a drink. And you're, you know, it feels like when I'm doing, you know, Zoom, you're like kind of tethered in spot and you have to be, you're so like focused that it feels, you know, it feels like, you know, if you're like, if you're off camera, like if you're standing over here, shuffling papers or something that it's almost like rude. And so you've got to be on the entire time as opposed to like if you're in a meeting, it's okay if you're, you know, looking at your notepad or doodling or whatever, that there's a little way to, you know, sort of disengage. Yeah, I have read that one of the strategies for preventing Zoom burnout for introverts or extroverts is to turn off your camera for a couple of your meetings when it's okay to do so and not having that pressure of needing to manage your facial expressions or a sit still or not doodle that will take some of that pressure off and help with that energy drain. Yeah, I personally, I, I the other day, I had a call with somebody. I went into my calendar and I was trying to find the Zoom link and I realized it was like an old-fashioned conference call. And I was like, oh my gosh, and I got on the call. I was like, man, this is great. I really <laughs> miss conference calls. I am, I'm just kind of, it's great for certain things, but for a lot, it's like, man, I, I want to go back to just regular phone calls. You know, it's funny because I think regular phone calls, it feels okay to not be on camera, but if you're on a Zoom or a Teams meeting and you're off camera and you just see the person's box, it feels like you're not as engaged as you could be. So the the feeling of it is different. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Pulling us back to our Spider-Man character, Jonah Jameson, the editor of the Daily Bugle, seems to me, Stacey, correct me if I'm wrong, but he seems to me to be a real extrovert. And he certainly seems to be a bully. I think we can agree on that. How can an introvert best deal with a boss who's an extrovert? That's a great question. I think that if you were an introvert and have an extroverted boss or manager, the most important thing is to communicate with your manager what you need as an introvert to be successful. But I think an introvert can be successful in any type of environment. The most important thing is to communicate and advocate 
for what you need for that to be so. And so for introverts, for example, that could mean not having back-to-back meetings all day, whether they're on Zoom or in person, because you typically will need that time to recharge. It could mean wanting time to respond to a query or request in writing so that you have the time to give it the thoughtfulness that you need not only not to burn you out, but so that you can produce your best work. Because you typically will not produce your best ideas, do your best work when you need to do it on the fly. And I do want to take a breath here just to call out that I've been saying typically or intend to a lot. And that's because none of these are hard and fast rules that apply to everyone who's introverted, nor to everyone who's introverted all the time. Their preferences and, and more comfortable places. Well, actually, that brings us to a next question that has been sort of my burning question, because I see pieces of introversion and extroversion in myself. And so bringing us back to our character, Peter Parker and Spider-Man are really the same person. And Peter Parker strikes me as an introvert, whereas Spider-Man seems to be more of an extrovert. Is it once an introvert, always an introvert? Or can an individual be an introvert in certain situations and an extrovert in other situations? So I think yes and kind of yes to both your questions. (laughs) Typically, the way you're wired is the way you're wired. So if you are an introvert, you are an introvert. What's going to be different is how you express that introversion in different situations. So there will be times, for example, when you are in a, a ballroom at a conference with 300 people and you know that part of your job is to make connections for your firm, for your employer, and that involves networking. Of course, that's what we're talking about. And for an extrovert, that could mean working the room, collecting 100 business cards, setting up 30 coffees over the the course of the next six months. But for you as an introvert, that is not going to work. So you're going to want to figure out two things. One, how can I lean into that extroverted space of 300 people in this room, but in a way that respects and taps into my introversion? So one suggestion I give folks is when you're trying to network like that, is identify three people you want to meet ahead of time, research them, find out about them, which is another strength of introverts, find them in the room, and have deeper, more meaningful conversations, which can actually lead to potentially more likely to be successful follow-up. So there are going to be situations when you need to lean into it. There are going to be situations when you need to be more outgoing and engaging with people throughout one given day because of a, a meeting you're at, a presentation you're given, you're giving any type of situation. But what you want to be mindful of is that you give yourself time to recharge and that over time, the types of things you're engaging in, the activities, the tasks, the roles, that on balance, they are going to fuel your energy more than drain your energy as an introvert. But we all need to be able to build and and flex that, even if you're an introvert, build and flex that extrovert muscle so that you can function in society. Right. Exactly. Function. That's exactly what I was just thinking, function in society. I also think your tip about researching three people ahead of time and zooming in on them in a big meeting is really a great idea for all folks, whether they're introverts or extroverts. It's probably much more meaningful than gathering 100 business cards, if anybody even carries business cards these days. Yep. Evan, you want to ask the next one? Yeah. We'll talk about our next clip here. And this one is from, we've used this movie before, but there's just so much great content from this movie for our podcast. It's Office Space, the cult classic. If you haven't seen it, you should drop what you're doing and go watch it. But in this particular clip, Milton, one of the best characters of the movie, he's already had his desk moved several times. And he's about to be told that he needs to move one more time. Let's take a listen to this classic clip. I, I don't care if they lay me off either because I told I told Bill that if they move my desk one more time, then... Then, I, then I'm quitting. I'm going to quit. And, and I told Dom, too, because they've moved my desk four times already this year, and I used to be over by the window, and I could see the squirrels, and they were married, but then they switched. C. Hi, Milton. And, but What's I, happening? I was, said, Milton, we're going to need to go ahead and move you downstairs into storage B. No. We uh, have some new people coming in, and we need all the space we can get. But there's no space. So if you could just go ahead and pack up your stuff and move it down there, that would be terrific. I I, I was told I could stay. Excuse me. I, I believe you have my stapler. 
Stacy, do introverts, do they find it harder to stick up for themselves in the workplace? I mean, based on what you've told us so far, I mean, it sounds like for sure, I guess, has that been your experience with your clients? I'd say that they find it harder to do so in a way that's the extrovert ideal. So the extrovert ideal is a phrase coined by Susan Cain, who's a prolific writer and researcher on the topic of introversion. And it's the idea that most workplaces and expectations of work are designed with extroverts in mind. So it's going to be more difficult, I'd say, for them to advocate for themselves on the spot and even verbally, which is the way that extroverts would typically do it. But they can be just as effective, if not more so, going back to my theme that you may have picked up on, and that's leaning into their introverted strengths. So here that could be giving thought to the reasoning behind their case and collecting data to support it, crafting their argument in writing, or perhaps verbally, but in a one-on-one situation, not in front of other people. I think a great example of this in a place where introverts need to, to step up for themselves is when we think about preventing burnout. So burnout, which can happen when day in and day out, you're having this depletion of your energy because your job or your tasks are, are not aligning with who you are as an introvert. So you could perhaps craft a memo to your manager talking about your bandwidth, talking about your commitment to the team, to a project. So if your manager comes to you, for example, and says, and announces at a staff meeting, let's say, Stacy, you're going to be taking on this new project. And you're thinking to yourself, I don't have time to do this. This is not aligned with my skill set. And your anxiety starts to bubble up a little bit. In that moment, speaking up is probably not going to give you the best results. But if you come back to your manager, either one-on-one or in writing and say, I want to share with you what my current workload is the current demands on my time. I'm committed to producing excellent work in all that I do. And I worry that if I take on what you're asking me to do, the quality of my work is going to suffer. And ideally, you could also respond with an alternate solution for the staffing need. Stacey, you've mentioned a couple of times sort of tips on how an introvert can speak up and let their manager know what they need and also identify themselves as an introvert to their managers. I have to imagine that's pretty challenging for introverts where they haven't done that, from the manager's point of view, how can a manager identify when some one of their employees is an introvert or an extrovert so that they could best support them? I think first and foremost, being aware of what introverted behavior and introverts typically look like. I think that's very important training for managers. So if, if you're aware without without even knowing that word or without your your employee or team member naming, saying that word introvert, if you see that You have a team member who tends to thrive more when they work by themselves, when they have time to recharge between meetings. So to pay attention to those dynamics. And I think any manager, any good manager, when you have a team of people, you're aware of what makes your folks tick, right? When are they doing their best work, whether it's the type of work or the circumstances under which they're doing that work. So I think paying attention to that and knowing Knowing what an introvert looks like as a manager, you can then tune into the type of support you need to provide to them to help them to thrive. The other piece that some organizations do is complete a Myers-Briggs assessment. My light bulb really went off when an organization I was working for about 15 years ago had us all do an MBTI assessment and brought in a facilitator to have the whole room discuss what does it mean to be an introvert or an extrovert. And as an example, and looking at all four dimensions of Myers-Briggs, as an example, he had folks separate into two groups, introverts on this side of the room, extroverts on that side of the room, and asked us each, okay, introverts, what do you want the extroverts to know about how you work best or what they do that makes you feel drained? And the extroverts did the same thing. And it was a really amazing thing and a really eye-opening and productive exercise for people to learn about others who they're working with. So I know for me, when I met people who had completely opposite MBTI letters than I did, I realized, oh, that's why you drive me crazy, right? Because we're just approaching things differently. And it's not that they're lazy or not disciplined or too creative or, or this or that. It's that we all approach things through different lenses based on how we're wired. And I like to say that the beauty is in the alphabet soup on a team. You want to have people who have a mix of letters. I will say that as a note, ethically, if you have employees do a Myers-Briggs type assessment, they do not have to share their report with you as a manager, as an HR organization. 
But when you do, you can get their permission to do that. And when you do exercises like that, it can naturally come out. Yeah, I would just also caution from a legal compliance perspective. One concern I would have is if a manager gets that information, even though being an introvert or an extrovert is not a protected category under the law, it does sort of give you personal information about an employee that you can't sort of unring the bell once you know that information. And if you then act in a sort of adverse way towards employees based on some personal attribute, you could get yourself into some hot water. So some caution there. Our last clip is about another favorite introvert, Sheldon from The Big Bang Theory. I've actually been wanting to do a Big Bang Theory episode for a long time now because there's so much you know fodder in that show. In this particular clip, Sheldon is asked to give a speech at a conference. All right. Uh, thank you. Problem. What? I expect me to give a speech at the banquet. I can't give a speech. Well, no, you're mistaken. You give speeches all the time. <laughs> I'm perfectly comfortable speaking to small groups. I cannot speak to large crowds. So, Stacy, are introverts just not suited to public speaking, or is this something they can learn to get past? I love this question because this is a huge myth about introverts that I'm really happy to dispel. First, I will share that about three quarters of all people, regardless of introversion or extroversion, struggle with or are afraid of public speaking. Second, and I think this will surprise many of your listeners, public speaking is extremely well aligned with introversion. And here's why. One, introverts prefer to speak when they have something well thought out and substantive to say. And in most cases, in advance of any presentation, a presenter spends time pulling together information, creating slides, and crafting a compelling case or report, whatever it is they're sharing. They have time to prepare and to do that in ways that align with their introverted strengths. Two, and this is a big one, when you're up on a stage presenting to a group, especially a large one, you do not have to make small talk. Think about that. In fact, casual impromptu conversation is rarely part of the gig. Another reason that introverts tend to actually excel at presenting is that we're natural storytellers, which I mentioned earlier. Most introverts, because we love to read and we're also highly creative, this sets us up to share powerful anecdotes or analogies when we're presenting, which I think many people would agree is often the most engaging or compelling part of a presentation. And lastly, when an introvert presents to a group of people who know her and have experienced her introversion in other settings, the fact that she's up there shining on the stage as a presenter, I think really captures their attention and can begin to shift what they think about that person in terms of their leadership and communication style. So not only do introverts like public speaking, but it's actually good for them because it shows them in a whole nother light. Yeah. So interesting. I feel like I'm learning a lot about myself during this episode. Right. Yeah. I know for me, I really enjoy presenting. And I recently learned about that piece of one of the reasons that aligns with us is because we don't have to engage in the small talk. And I thought, absolutely, that makes perfect sense. Last question for you. Are there certain communication techniques that managers should use with introverts as opposed to extroverts? Yes. As we talked about earlier, because introverts prefer to have time to digest information to find data, to go deep in terms of their thoughts before responding to something, communicating with introverts in writing is often a good way to go. For example, and I think most organizations do this, you would know better than I do, but when you're giving your employees their annual performance appraisal, to give it to them in writing ahead of time so that they can digest it and making sure that they have an opportunity to respond in writing as well. So it's not sitting with them across from the table and saying, let's talk about the feedback I gave you or talk about for your plan, talk about what your plan is for the year ahead. So certainly giving them that opportunity to respond in writing when you're communicating with them, understanding that you may not get an immediate response and giving them the time and space to do that. So again, they can tap into their strengths as an introvert when they're communicating back with you. And the last thing I'd say about communication is that because, as I mentioned earlier, we tend to all live and work in environments that are aligned with the extrovert ideal, to really reinforce to your introverted team members the value that they bring to your organization, to your project. 
so that they're feeling valued and they're hearing that in the ways that you're communicating with them, whether it's formally or informally. Sounds like good techniques for all employees, introverts and extroverts, as a way to most effectively manage people. Yeah, that's right. I'm curious. It sounds like it would be a good idea for folks to really kind of identify whether or not they're more introvert, more extrovert, and use that as sort of a, an additional career planning tool in terms of finding jobs that are maybe more suited to their style. I'm just curious, is that something that you see people doing more now? I mean, I, I know that the introversion, extroversion discussion seems like it's happening a lot more than it used to. And I'm wondering if you see folks taking that into account in like long-term planning. Yeah, absolutely. So knowing whether you have a preference for introversion or extroversion can help you seek out careers, jobs, roles that give you more opportunity than less to tap into your introverted or extroverted strengths. So I think for the most part, whether you're introverted or extroverted, you can do most jobs, right? I would advise against a job if you're an introvert, you probably don't want to be a front desk receptionist or a customer service representative who's on the phone with folks all day long. But if you look for careers and roles that allow you to have that balance, and if you're an introvert, that the balance is in favor of tasks and jobs that are going to fuel your energy as an introvert, that you're likely setting yourself up for success in that way. And again, when you're in a role to be aware of what does my daily schedule look like? What's the flow of my day, the flow of my work week? And figure out how you can schedule your day, structure your day in ways that align with your introversion. So for example, I am a morning person. I have the most brain power, the most energy in the morning, and I tend to dip in the afternoon. So for me, I try to schedule meetings for the mornings. I try to schedule work that requires me to, to go deep thought-wise. And then in the afternoon, I'll try to do some lighter things like administrative work, which is kind of mindless to me, or marketing work or other tasks that don't drain my energy as much and don't need me to be firing on all cylinders in terms of creativity and insights and, and all that stuff. So I guess if managers were to take away a couple of bottom line tips here, it would be give your introvert employees lots of advance notice of what's expected, some time to sort of think it through, give them the stage when you can, but with enough time for them to prepare ahead of time. Anything else that I'm missing? I would say no introvert is the same. So you may have an employee who you identify as likely being introverted, but the way that introversion shows up for them and sets them up for success is going to be unique to them. So get to know your employees. You can ask them what you can do to support them better, to understand what they need to be at their best. And some introverts will have more self-awareness of that than others. And over time, you can hopefully work with your employees, with your team members to help them figure that out so that you can set them up to be most successful in their role for you. Listen, Stacy, this has been a really interesting conversation. I've really learned a lot today. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you listeners for tuning in to our latest episode of Hiring to Firing. Please check us out. You can find us wherever you get your podcasts and also check out our blog, hiringtofiring.law. Thanks so much. Copyright Troutman Pepper Hamilton Sanders, LLP. These recorded materials are designed for educational purposes only. This podcast is not legal advice and does not create an attorney-client relationship. The views and opinions expressed in this podcast are solely those of the individual participants. Troutman Pepper does not make any representations or warranties, express or implied, regarding the contents of this podcast. Information on previous case results does not guarantee a similar future result. Users of this podcast may save and use the podcast only for personal or other non-commercial educational purposes. No other use, including without limitation, reproduction, retransmission or editing of this podcast may be made without the prior written permission of Troutman Pepper. If you have any questions, please contact us at Troutman.com.